Yeah, I think in, in any conversation about complacency or something like that, you know, um, it really calls for a, a concrete analysis, right? I think too often we're content to fall back on, oh, well, things have changed, things aren't what they used to be. But I remember being very active uh, in the sort of, you know, what was called the anti-globalization movement. Um, uh, you know, I sort of got involved after Seattle. Uh, it was sort of a political awakening for me. Uh, and I remember planning, helping to plan uh, a protest plan for September 30th, 2001 against the IMF World Bank meeting. And, you know, September 11th happened. And I remember, I mean, maybe it's, it's, I only sort of realized this a couple of years later, but that was a real, you know, for me at least, I think it was a turning point because what ended up happening was of the two sort of coalitions organizing uh, <coughs> the protest, one of them, the larger one, Mobilization for Global Justice, kind of pulled out saying, well, you know, September 11th happened for a variety of, variety of reasons, right? Some people didn't think it was appropriate. Um, others were just scared of the amount of, of police repression that, that would probably be, probably meet us there. But the protest went on anyway with half the people sort of uh, who turned out. You know, it wasn't very big. It certainly sort of wasn't in line with, with Seattle and, and the mobilization in D.C. that had happened after that. Um, and I remember thinking at the time that that was a real missed opportunity. Um, and I don't really know sort of what could have changed that, right? And maybe had there been some kind of analysis about, or, or an attempt to really try trying to link those two issues together. And then I remember thinking the same thing during uh, the sort of run up to the war in Iraq. Um, there was, you know, I was part of a, a tiny minuscule movement against the war in Afghanistan. I mean, that barely registered on, on the national political scene. But certainly there was a mo big mobilization against the war in Iraq before it started. And if you all remember, on February, was it 13th, 15th, 2003, there were, I was in New York City, there were over a million people on the streets. There were millions of people on the streets in, in, in basically every major city in the world. And, uh, you know, that, that didn't stop the war. Uh, the day after the war started in, in March 2003, there were major mobilizations in San Francisco, in Chicago, where I was at the time, uh, and elsewhere. But I distinctly, I mean, people might have experienced this differently, but I definitely remember, at least in my experience, that anti-war activity dropped off pretty dramatically once the war actually started. And to this day, I'm not quite sure what, why that is. And I mean, I have my suspicions. I think. I think it actually has points to the importance of coming up with some sort of political analysis, right? I think the, the political analysis of the anti-war movement before the run-up to the war uh, was in a lot of ways misguided, and what ended up happening was the experience of the war maybe um, sort of confused a lot of people, right? Um, I think people were expecting an immediate sort of uh, a sort of a bathism, you know, sans Saddam Hussein, right? And what ended up happening was something a little bit different. People didn't know what to, to make of that. In any case, that's not important. I guess what, what I'm trying to say is that we really need to look at the sort of, uh, make a concrete analysis of why politically, you know, the left is as weak as it is today. I, I don't think that was a, a predetermined outcome, definitely not. I don't think it has to do with a, a vague cultural notions. I think there's specific decisions that were made um, you know, specific sort of forces at play that, that led to that situation. And one of the big mysteries to me is with the, the, the financial crisis, now an, an economic crisis, right? Where, where is the mobilization? I mean, yeah, if we look hard enough, we see resistance everywhere, of course, right? But the point is sometimes those, those little pieces of resistance kind of build up and resonate and create something much larger. But that creation of something much larger is something that I think hasn't happened, but we really need to, I think, think a little bit more concretely about why that's the case. Well, I want to say that a part of that, part of that is going to be uh, our, your scholarship. Part of that is going to be your thinking. The movement needs our thinking. We have many questions. There are people who have questions all the time. And the I got uh, I felt the brand dignity as a scholar in uh, only when I taught in Attica. When the uh, brothers in my class s said to me that I had something I had something they wanted. 
then I knew I had to be a teacher. You have something that's needed. That's what I want to say is that what you have must be formed with a relationship uh, to the movement or to the class that because we can't make a there is no working class with, without us there is no working class without that is a class that will move a class that uh, can reconstitute that can take responsibility for reconstituting the classes of the society of our society such does not exist without minds without without your without our labors of how the world can be different so i want to we're living as you say in this defeat the largest mobilization of, of in the world in world history was February and then March, right, 2003. The Green Scare, the number of direct actionists who have been uh, sent off to prison. The assassination of the Muslim Imam in Detroit last week. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the incarceration of Reverend Pinckney in on the west side of the state. The declaration of endless war. This is now, this is part of our, of the, of rule. That means it's part of what people think, it's part of how people are trained. It's not just, it's not the White House or Summers. It's all over the society. It's all, all through the structures of power, huh? from the local realtors on up. Or not, I mean, why say up? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but it takes yeah. people to break out of that. So there must be a conscious decision <coughs> by a group of people to start mobilizing against those, this repression that's coming down, as you just said, uh, by putting people in jail, by uh, defeating people on a picket line or in their factory. So there must be a group that kind of decide to go against the grain and move and organize. And it seems like not a lot of people have time to do that anymore. And uh, it's a problem of time, it's a problem of culture. And it's probably a problem of drugs also. A lot of people are taking antidepressants <laughs> in a very high number. So people are kind of drugged up and, and don't have time. And, but eventually, some people will organize, come together and organize and break. And I remember when I was part of campaign against apartheid in UC Berkeley, that just a few months before there was an article in the Daily Cal at that time saying of how apathetic the students were, that there were not such a period with students being so apathetic. And then just a few months later, some people, a small group of people, like 10 or less people, started doing a picket line for apartheid on UC Berkeley <coughs> every day, every day, every day. And then the news was that in Colombia, students took over the university. And immediately, they started taking over the university. Many more students came. So I think it's a matter of constant work and momentum that eventually create an action that attracts a lot more people. And then it breaks out for a while, and, and it happens until there is more repression coming down against it and it's being squashed, and then it starts somewhere else. But it's kind of a perpetual motion. Anyway. That was good. <laughs>